All right, pick it up at verse 10. So we got this young, naive man walking down the street. Verse 10, then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home, now in the street, now in the squares. At every corner she lurks. She took hold of him and kissed him, and with a brazen face she said, Today I fulfilled my vows, and I have food from my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you. I looked for you and have found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money, and I will not be, and will not be home till full moon. So she came out to meet him, and she comes right up to him. What do you think it means that she was dressed like a prostitute? Okay, entice, seduce, yeah, yeah. She's dressed seductively because she's tempting him, right? She's tempting him. And, and there's nothing gentle or soft or warm about her. She's loud and brash and brazen. She's aggressive in trying to get what she wants. Find temptation operates like that? Is temptation attractive? Of course. I mean, you know, if she'd come out and she looked like a monster or looked like a frog. Or <laughs> librarian. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right? I mean, Satan knows how to seduce us. Whatever, you know, whatever the temptation is, whatever the sin he's trying to get us to participate in, he makes it look attractive. He's not an idiot, right? So down in verses 14 through 20 then, it says she tells him all kinds of things to make him believe that he can enjoy his sin and get away with it, right? She says that she has done her religious duty, and so she came out to meet him. Um, Today I fulfilled my vows, and I have food from my fellowship offering at home, so... I came out to meet you. Isn't that interesting? In other words, that's the reason I'm coming out to meet you. Um, Satan wants us to think that we can have our sin and still be okay with God. Right? God's love. God's love. You can do what you want to do. He's still going to love you. Right? God is... God is grace. God is grace. His grace will just cover that over. So yeah, she, she, the first thing she tells him is God's going to be okay with this. God's okay with this because I just, you know, we can have our sin and God's good with that. And then she says that she's covered and perfumed her bed. And in verse 18, she calls the sin she's trying to seduce him into love. And they just met, right? <laughs> I don't even know it. Don't know anybody's name. Yeah. Just, she walked up to him, kissed him, said, I love you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's no love involved. I mean, how many sins are being rationalized today under the word love? Right? And then the last rationalization she offers is that no one has to know. Her husband's gone. They can enjoy their sin and get away with it. Nobody's going to find out. Now, this is what I put in my notes. I don't know that I feel the same tonight, but this is what I put in my notes, okay? It says, I'm not exactly sure why, but right here I was reminded of an article I read recently by Carrie Newwolf, entitled, 15 Characteristics of Today's Unchurched Person. It said, the first thing he listed was, they don't all have big problems. He said, if you're waiting for unchurched people to show up because their life is falling apart, you might wait a long time. Sure, there are always people in crisis who seek God out, but many are quite content with their lives without God, and some are quite happy and successful. If you only know how to speak into discontent and crisis, you will miss most of your neighbors. Got neighbors living this kind of lifestyle? You are talked about in Proverbs 7? They're probably in perfectly happy in it, right? Second thing he lists 
They feel less guilty than you think. He says they don't feel any more guilty about not being in church on Sunday than you feel guilty about not being in synagogue on Saturdays. How many Saturdays do you feel bad about missing synagogue? That's how many Sundays they feel bad about missing church. In fact, many unchurched people view their free Sunday morning as a benefit to no longer going to church. This may hurt some pastor's feelings. It does a little. But a morning, <laughs> but a morning hike or Sunday brunch with friends is often preferable to sitting through a church service. So we don't go home all depressed. He also says this. And this is the 13th. He lists 15 things. This was number 13 on the list in describing the unchurch today. He says, they invite their friends if they like what they're discovering. He writes, unchurched people are often pretty social. They want to experience things together with people they love and enjoy spending time with. They will be your best inviters if they love what you're doing and will help grow and build an engaged church culture. And I just, uh, kind of as I was going through this earlier in the day, um, just kind of reading how she came at him and, and the, the proposals she made to him, just thought, that's the world we live in, right? And, and if our approach is, shamey, 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 okay? That probably is not going to go anywhere with most of those people. They're probably not going to say, oh, I need Jesus, you know, if, if that's the way we approach them. And so I think Satan has been very successful in removing the guilt and shame of sin. And so, yes, people need to be forgiven and their guilt and shame removed, but that might not be our best introduction. Maybe we need to think about how to open doors of communication and interest and then getting to that point of confronting sin when we're reaching out to the unchurched.